Kicking off the list at number 10, The Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course, one of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't, I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. The poor guy suffocated in his own, what a horrible way to go out, one of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the Dark Ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and Voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly, yeah. The poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the Iron Chair. Not to be confused with the Iron Throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go. Who to crack in the mic? The iron chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used. You know, like I mentioned, the ducking stool in part one. That was that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs, so you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. 
Oh my gosh. In our number five spot today, we have the Executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the Medieval Times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is, of course, now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge, hooded, evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people, of course, saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times, they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay, really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Rat Catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connections were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. Food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number 2 spot today we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was common given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough, for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Kicking off the list at number 10, the heretic's fork. Ah uh, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck right off the bat, here we go. The heretic's fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst in my opinion because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment and then no one has to even be responsible. A double sided medieval fork, an old rusty horrible fork would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady you name it. So now the victim has to keep their neck straight or else the obvious and horrible 
What happened? Ugh, I hate it. I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them, I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The heretics fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device. Yeah, it was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these heretic forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down and it says that in Latin, Get out of the house, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy, let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed, would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. You didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also, don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties. But finally, this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice, go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight. Don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, I'm not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called the Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose, Think again, pal, that's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. When be done. Krakows or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's beat? That's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes. It was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, a squire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches, go into the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back into your Berks and socks. Number six, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst. Because of the type of psychological distress that it causes, here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones, it was pitch black, it was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible, stinky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. 
All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you. Or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number 4. Arranged Marriages All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promise daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number 3. Marital Disputes I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number 2. Mail Order This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number 1. Married Games This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part, and depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's not you guys. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy. Kick it off the list at number 10, Black Cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory IX, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which, my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now, at first, when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station 
just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat. That's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well. Even going back further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to. I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman law laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really? Was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know... Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 15th 61, which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, 
Shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. In fifth place, we have job inequality. Come on, it's not enough to pay women less. We gotta give them the crappier jobs as well. The lowest paying jobs available to working class London women were matchbox making and sorting rags in a rag factory where flea and lice ridden rags were to be sorted to be pulped for manufacturing paper. Needlework was the single largest paid occupation for women working from home, but the work paid little, and women often had to rent sewing machines if they cannot purchase them. So, where's that money going? These home manufacturing industries became known as sweated industries. The select committee of the House of Commons defined sweated industries in 1890 as work carried on for inadequate wages and for excessive hours in unsanitary conditions. Wow, I'm shocked. By 1906, such workers earned about a penny an hour. In fourth place, we have limitations on hobbies. Yep because controlling a woman's body, work, and forcing her to run a household and reproduce wasn't enough. Nah. Women's physical activity was a cause of concern at the highest levels of academic research during this time. Sadly, uh, here in Canada, physicians debated the appropriateness of women using bicycles. Remember that purity culture I mentioned a moment ago? Yeah, here we go again. A series of letters published in the Dominion Medical Monthly and Ontario Medical Journal in 1896 expressed concern that women seated on a bicycle seat could have uh, an organ Oh no. Fearful of unleashing and creating a nation of oversexed females, some physicians urged colleagues to encourage women to give up modern dangers and continue to pursue traditional leisure pursuits. Seriously. However, not all medical colleagues were convinced of the link between cycling and and this debate on women's leisure activities continued well into the 20th century. In the early part of the 19th century, it was believed that physical activity was dangerous and inappropriate for women. Girls were taught to reserve their delicate health for the express purpose of birthing healthy children, and one of these considered benefits of the corset was to restrict respiration. Don't worry, I'll get back to corset hill and myths in just a moment. Furthermore, the physiological differences between the sexes helped to reinforce the societal inequality. An anonymous female writer was able to contend that women were not intended to fill male roles because women are, as a rule, physically smaller and weaker than men, their brain is much lighter, and they are in every way unfitted for the same amount of bodily or mental labor that men are able to undertake. Well, pardon me and my tiny brain. Can I be excused and paid to go sit on a fainting couch? In third place, we have corset trends. I'm gonna start this by making sure everyone knows that I'm emphasizing the harmful trends, not dismissing corsets as a whole. I'm personally a huge fan of corsets and various historical shapewear, since when worn properly, they're actually quite comfortable and beneficial to one's health and posture. Improperly worn corsets, or ones worn too tight, can cause a variety of problems. And my displaced ribs are a sad example of that. Anyhow, allow me to continue before I sidetrack myself to infinity and beyond. Victorian women's clothing followed trends that emphasized elaborate dresses, skirts with wide volume created by the use of layered materials such as crinolines, hoop skirt frames, and heavy fabrics. The ideal silhouette of the time demanded a narrow waist, which was accomplished by constricting the abdomen with a tightly laced corset. While the silhouette was striking, and the dresses themselves were often exquisitely detailed creations, the fashions weren't ideal. At best, they restricted women's movements, and at worst, they had a harmful effect on women's health. Physicians turned their attention to the use of corsets and uh, determined that they caused several medical problems. Compression of the thorax, restricted breathing, organ displacement, poor circulation, and uh, prolapsed uterus. Oh no, can't harm that baby making factory. Articles advocating the reform of women's clothing by the British National Health Society, the Ladies Dress Association, and the Rational Dress Society were reprinted in the Canada Lancet, Canada's medical journal. Nowadays, courses are a choice, not a necessity, and I often prefer them over the more popular underwire bra. In second place, we have Magdalene Asylums. So Magdalene, As so Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were initially Protestant, but later mostly Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house uh, fallen women. The institutions were named after the biblical figure Mary Magdalene, who in you know, earlier centuries characterized as a reformed lady of the night. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in undesirable fields, young women who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young women who just didn't have familial support. They were required to work without pay. Apart from meager food provisions, well, the institutions operated large commercial laundries, serving customers outside of their bases. Many of these laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes of the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. This contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women, as opposed to uh, punishing them. The last one known closed only in 1996, which is a year 
before I was born, so they went on for way too long. In our first place, we have Woman of the Night. During the Victorian age, women selling their bodies was a wide-scale problem in Britain. The very essence of it went against every moral value that was promoted during this time. Values such as, you know, chastity, prudence, and grace were dismissed and disregarded by fallen women. These women were led into this line of work for varying reasons, the most prominent being, you know, social and economic concerns. Upon entering into this world, there were several different avenues that could be taken by women, including military encampments, brothels, and um, street walking. The number of women participating in this trade during the Victorian age was uh, staggeringly high. Although London police reports recorded that you know there were approximately 8,600 women of the night known to them, it has been suggested that the true number during this time was closer to 80,000. As a result, concerns were raised, and the prominence led to several government acts. Goodness forbid a woman try and make money for herself on her own terms through selling something that would already be part of a dowry. This act would allow women to barter within the marketplace without influence of men who would often take their earnings and goods. And that brings us to the end of our list, and I'm sure you can see the smoke pouring out of my ears. Oh gosh, what a scandal. I've been talking about women's undergarments, sexuality, and been paid to do so. I'm definitely a modern gal, and a queer one who is very happy to be living in the time I'm currently in. Sure, things are far from perfect, but I have rights over my body, and marriage is a choice, not a living. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required wading in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our number nine spot today, we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times, there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore, thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that, because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Groom of the Stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the Groom of the Stool comes in, this high level noble men would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And 
should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today we have the Nightman. This is definitely one of the shittiest jobs from the medieval times and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness and they were motivated to gather as much as possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous too. I mean if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today we have a sin eater. Okay, This is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. I don't know, both bad. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up in your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with Saint Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number 3, Belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short term memory loss confusion, disorientation, and in some cases death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. 
Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it. And it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells shells and in Europe the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the renaissance trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? Just got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10, Nati Nati. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell are spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. 
What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sound just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey, Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone. And and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known 
events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars, and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo, to the royals, to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. In 10th place, we have loss of rights under marriage. Under English common law, a married woman lost her legal independence, she could not enter contracts or sue, and her property and obligations were mostly subsumed by those of her husband, the couple becoming a single legal entity. In less legalese, any property she might have had in her name, be it through a family holdings or being, you know, signed over, became her husband's and not hers the moment she signed her marriage license. Mm. Also, any personal property acquired by the wife during the marriage effectively came under the full control of her husband. A married woman was unable to dispose of any property without her husband's consent, and upon divorce, women generally had no rights to any property accumulated during marriage, usually leaving them uh, impoverished. Women were able to retain some property they possessed prior to marriage in certain cases during a divorce. Certain cases. So if your dad gifted you, say, a summer home for safety, and you wanted to divorce your husband and take back that uh, rightfully given home for your new home, yeah, uh, good luck getting that back. Besides the dowries, prenuptial agreements effectively allowed married women to maintain beneficial interest in her previously owned or inherited real property, which was placed under trusteeship, allowing her to have a separate income from her husband. Moral of this story, Sign the damn prenup. In ninth place, we have a uh, lack of consent in marriage. So in addition to losing your rights over whatever property you brought into the arrangement, if you are a girl like me, consent and rights over your own body um, didn't exist. Marriage overrode a woman's right to consent to sexual intercourse with her husband, giving him effective ownership over her body. Honestly, just add it to the dowry list. Insert man's name here uh, is to be gifted however many gold coins, a couple of cows, the right to my land, all in the rights to do what he pleases with my body. Am I ever we're glad I live in today's day and age. I have the right to look at that and say, uh, absolutely not. Women were expected to have sex with only one man, her husband. Just imagine a husband for me here, okay? On the flip side, it was acceptable for men to have multiple partners in their life. Some husbands had lengthy affairs with other women, while their wives stayed with their husbands because uh, divorce wasn't always an option. But if a woman had sexual contact with another man, she was seen as ruined or fallen and considered to have violated the marriage. Yeah, gotta love a double standard. Victorian literature and art was full of examples of women paying dearly for straying from moral expectations. Adulterous met tragic ends in novels, including the ones by, you know, great writers such as Tolstoy, Flaubert, or Thomas Hardy, as opposed to the modern possibility of happiness and fulfillment from adultery. While some writers and artists showed sympathy towards women's subjugation to this double standard, some works were uh, didactic and uh, reinforced the cultural norm. In the Victorian era, sex was not discussed openly and honestly. Public discussions of sexual encounters and matters were met with uh, feigned ignorance, embarrassment, and fear. One public opinion of women's sexual desire desires was that they were not very troubled by sexual urges. Even if women's desires were lurking, sexual experiences came with 
consequences for women and families. Limiting family sizes resulted in resisting sexual desires, except when a husband had desires which, as a wife, women were contracted to fulfill. To discourage premarital sexual relations, the new poor law provided that women bear financial responsibilities for out-of-wedlock pregnancies. In 1834, women were made legally and financially supportive of their illegitimate children. Sexual relations for women could not just be about desire and feelings. This was a luxury reserved for men. The consequences of sexual interactions for women took away the physical desires that women could possess. In eighth place, we have purity culture. The ideal Victorian woman was pure, refined, and modest. Makes me gag to say it, but here goes nothing. This ideal was supported by etiquette and manners. The etiquette extended to the pretension of never acknowledging the use of undergarments, which would be referred to as unmentionables. The discussion of such a topic, it was feared, would gravitate towards unhealthy attention on anatomical details. As one Victorian lady expressed it, these are not things, my dear, that we speak of. Indeed, we try not even to think of them, in contrast to the modern norms of frank and constant discussion of, you know, details. Pardon me while I'm rolling my eyes here. The pretense of avoiding acknowledgement of anatomical realities met with the uh, embarrassing failure on occasion. For example, in 1859, the Honorable Eleanor Stanley wrote about an incident where the Duchess of Manchester hooped too quickly while maneuvering over a style. Tripping over her large hoop skirt, she went head over heels, landing on her feet with her cage and her whole petticoats above her head. They say there was never such a thing seen, and the other ladies hardly knew whether to be thankful or not that a part of her undergarments consisted in a pair of scarlet tartan knickerbockers, which were revealed to the view of all the world in general, and to the Duke de Malakoff in particular. What a scandal. However, despite the fact that Victorians considered the mention of women's undergarments in mixed company unacceptable, men's entertainment made great comedic material out of the topic of ladies' bloomers, including men's magazines and music hall skits. Ah, there's that icky double standard again. In seventh place, we have denial of education. Women were generally expected to marry and perform household and motherly duties, rather than seek a formal education. Even women who were not successful in finding husbands were were generally expected to remain without university degrees and to take a position as a governess or as a supporter to other members of the family. The outlook for education-seeking women improved when Queen's College in Harley Street, London, was founded in 1848. The goal of this college was to um, provide governesses with a marketable education because, you know, gotta have a governess. Later, the Cheltenham Ladies College and other girls' public schools were founded, increasing educational opportunities for women's education and leading eventually to the development of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies in 1897. I'm great at entertaining the spawn of others, but I promise you all that I'm not someone you want as a mom or a teacher. Nah. -uh. In sixth place, we have lower pay. Women cannot be expected to be paid the same wage as a man for the same work, despite the fact that women were as likely as men to be you know, married and supporting children. In 1906, the government found that the average weekly factory wage for a woman ranged from 11 cents over three days to 18 cents over eight days, whereas a man's average weekly wage was around 25 cents for nine days. Women were also preferred by many factory owners because they could be more easily induced to undergo severe bodily fatigue than men. Childminding was another necessary expense for many women working in factories. Pregnant women worked up until the day they gave birth and returned to work as soon as they were physically able. In 1891, a law was passed requiring women to take four weeks away from the factory work after giving birth. But many women could not afford this unpaid leave and the law remained unenforced. This point as a whole is still, sadly, a reality in our modern day. Many women don't make the same as men for the same jobs and are expected to do more for less. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtip. The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a buck tooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number four, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of Defender of the Faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> 
Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic community, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and Oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Yeah, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now, when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics, and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queez hit night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time a side in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, beyond, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start, and where, and why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently, with the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah. These things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah. It became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the Middle Ages had some good traditions, along with like how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. 
Continued rebellions and resistance to Williams continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, taxes. Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from? The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah. This was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh, Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I gotta phone H&R Block. Number seven, The Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three-part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard I, leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East. The Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. PETA would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great, and then there was like trying a rat before a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falaise, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> Gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like. Also, isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah. Prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your Honor, a small recess, please. Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles, it was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, witches. They were not cursed, they just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. It's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal. Please. 
While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go brrr on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pull vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches, people who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial. Actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep. I wonder what house this pig would belong to. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so, you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night, not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away, still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. 
Yep, that's history. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cockatrice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig. Because... Why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an entremetta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass. But he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid. And flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law, and so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of a hacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned 
cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the St. Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily, things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. Five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, for being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? Disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did and then we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone? No thank you, let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended, I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows? Maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake, just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy, and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying. Number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but 
cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible. Get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too. Really, this is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person, and still in the punishment, begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. And many of you see where I'm going already, and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Horrible, huh? Yeah, that's history. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. The Groom of the Stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. At number nine, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. At number seven, fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. 
They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. Gross. At number six, Ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with Ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the dark ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? If there's anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation, ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go, keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale, there you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back, so. <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest 
At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilian Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing, as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals, they wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number nine, town crier. I'm sure you've heard of the town crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the town crier, you might also think of the famous hear ye, hear ye that is associated with the speeches of the town criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the town crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The town crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase, hear ye, hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye, 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 which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs, though, was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number seven, Reeve. These days, we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that, and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number six, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. 
This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. Number five. The Great Charter. Ah yes, time for some peace. Well, kinda. A peace treaty. The initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow. Like, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the Law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Templars. Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically, the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem, also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again. Kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The Order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships. Basically old dogs who could still fight were looking to do some private security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, jesters. In the 12th century, the title of Fool began, aka the jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter, and tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Pateur was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, the jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rules soccer, AKA 
mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob, I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town, and no murdering. Yeah, no murdering, okay? So this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, there is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment such a game to be used in the city in the future. Damn, like band band, huh? Thankfully, the game of football has calmed down over the years. <laughs> yeah, right. Just go to a Manchester versus Liverpool game. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory the Ninth had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another, I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 120 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number 7 spot today we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891 until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Bonifacio 
Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed again and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed, all right? So I guess the other Pope had his justice in the end. I don't know, man. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up nice imagining that he was St. George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. Number five is the Russian beard tax. All right, so this technically was just outside the realm of medieval times and into middle times, but in 1698, Russian Emperor Peter the Great placed a tax on beards, hoping to force men to adopt the clean shaven look that was common in Western Europe. Peter's goal was to shift Russia to an Eurocentric visual. His return from a two year escapade in Europe had him changing up the fashion trends as well, replacing their long familiar Russian overcoats with French or Hungarian style jackets. They were shorter in length. It meant anyone walking the streets in an old fashioned robe was liable to have it cut short by Peter's designated fashion inspectors. The same inspectors would approach any bearded man they saw, requesting to see his beard token, a silver coin with a leafed edge and in the center a mustache, nose, and beard. This token was given to men who had paid their legally mandated beard tax for the year. No token provided when asked, doesn't matter if you forgot it at home. The inspectors would cut your beard off on the spot or simply rip it out of your face. The Russian Orthodox Church, which hated Peter the Great, saw this as a downright scandal as their teachings considered uncut facial hair a reflection of piety, seeing as man was created in the image of God, which included a beard. To shave it was a grave sin, but the church never really could stop Peter or his wily goals. This beard tax remained in place until 1772. Nowadays, these beard tokens are actually extremely rare collectibles, selling for as much as $10,000 in auctions today. Number four tells you don't mess with royal animals, whether it's eating them, hunting them, or breeding them. The royals had some rules for their medieval animals. First up is how in 1332, a statute passed established the king shall have throughout the realm whales and great sturgeons taken in the sea or elsewhere within the realm. In normal English terms, what they're saying is any whales or sturgeons that were caught or washed up on crown ruled soil, it had to first be offered to royalty before being pilfered. This law is actually still in place today but rarely ever actualized on. However, in 2004, a fun Welsh fisherman diligently complied with the law by offering a sturgeon he had caught to the queen herself. 
She politely declined the offer. Interestingly enough, the provisions of this statute are expressly protected from repeal by the Wild Creatures and Forest Laws Act of 1971, as it ensures hunting these animals is minimized. Wanna offend a royal? No? Pay attention to your dog, as it's an offense to let your dog mate with any dog belonging to a royal family member. Queen Elizabeth II's corgis of modern day are included, as this law is also still valid now. There were animal laws that weren't just for royals, however, a law said that keeping a pigsty in front of your home was illegal unless it was well hidden. You also weren't allowed to be in charge or ride horses and cows if you were intoxicated, the first drunk driving regulations. And as you may know, even animals could face the judge and jury in animal court for their crimes. Number three, we discuss how excessive food consumption led to restrictive laws on how food and drink were to be made, sold, and consumed. This is a great example of sumptuary laws from the point 10, where the royalty is irritated by blurring lines between them and the bourgeois. In 1309, Edward II criticized the outrageous and excessive multitude of meats and dishes that the nobles were eating, emulating the lifestyle of their superiors. So Edward III, in 1336, enacts a law that would have made his daddy proud. No man of whatever rank he shall be shall be served a meal with more than two courses except for certain festivals such as Christmas on which three courses were allowed. Edward III said that many mischiefs caused by the many sorts of costly meats which people in this realm had used was the reason for this decision. But seeing as commoners were practically starving to death at the time, it's obvious where this law was pointed. These laws may or may not have influenced the behavior, but there was no real evidence of any actual enforcement of them. So despite this, the statute wasn't repealed until 1856, but there was no proof of it being used. Scold, and no, not what your mom does when you don't clean your room, is number two. The word scold was used as a legal term for women who disturbed their peers or husbands' peace with quarreling, gossiping, slander, brawling, or even just talking too much. Imagine he left his socks on the floor again, you tell him to put them away, and boom, just like that, you're a scold. While being a scold wasn't a crime, it was criminally punishable, and they had quite a few imaginative and funky ways in which to do so, such as a scold's brittle, which is an iron cage lit or mouth that encases the mouth exterior and interior, ensuring that the woman's mouth opens or even her tongue moves, metal spikes would lacerate and puncture her. Sometimes they would even add insult to injury by parading the woman around town in the brittle to face scorn or by chaining her to a fireplace where she could inhale ash and soot and desperately try not to cough lest she gets the brittle spikes. There was also a yoke, a type of wooden restraint that could either hold one or two people. A woman could be married to wear one alone, sent walking for hours under the disproportionate weight as a punishment, or she might be locked up with the woman she was fighting with, in which case you don't have the discomfort of the way, but you do have the discomfort of staring at your rival's ugly mug for a while. Doing the do and when to comes in at number one. In medieval times, there were numerous religious laws enacted that aimed to restrict the act of reproduction and the times in which it could be done. In a seven day week, a married couple could only engage four of the days. Thursday and Fridays were no no days as people were supposed to prepare for the Holy Communion, and Sunday as well because it was the Lord's Day. In a year itself, the 47 to 62 days of Lent and then the 40 to 60 days of the Feast of Pentecost, relations were prohibited. For the 35 days leading up to Christmas, it was also banned. Anyways, medieval folks considered the eyes important in regards to a person's sexual appetite, so it was also encouraged not to make eye contact during banned periods with someone if you're attracted to them. That I can actually kind of get. It is a romance movie trope after all. Anyways, outside of a religious factor, abstinence during Lent ensured no babies would be born during winter time periods when food was scarce and it was harder to endure pregnancy. Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you want to be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. 
Johnny Depp needs your help right now. So maybe, maybe be a lawyer. Call him up. Say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight. And like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of Black Plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number 8. Ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there, whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learning useful skills and could be a great career choice. It could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, war of the bucket. One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially to the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's, I think it's bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs. One supporting the emperor, one supporting the pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research, it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It kind of gets a little muddy there because a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes, <laughs> ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil, get him. Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310 in the French town of Rouen, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples, as sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police, uh-oh. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal, even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms out there who do great work. You're the best. Way to go, moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything and anything and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers. You get the point. It's kind of gross. But at some point, after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious. Enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep, gabagool, while you're at it. Why not? You know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks, with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine, if you would, how you would feel after grouping ruling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders, and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals, and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner, and on top of that, they're sewing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle just like a turducken, because they're bored, and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside, and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things. 
then I can say no, you know? However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie? Uh, that I'm not too sure of, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a big greasy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a entrail pie? Oh. That must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great, you guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions, and honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun, and watching reality TV shows when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention, and its hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then. Thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just want to pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please. More like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Dude, gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Kicking off our list at number 10, rat poison. Yeah, this one's pretty, uh, pretty gross right off the hop. During the 16th century, it was common to fill your house with arsenic trioxide to keep rats from your food supply, right? You don't want those guys hanging around. They're bringing the plague in, a little nasty. Barbara Gilbert of Leicestershire, she thought that she was grabbing flour and ended up mixing this stuff with milk. That was a really bad mistake. Steak. She thought she was preparing a meal for her family when really she was about to poison them. Now it's horrible to say, but Barbara, she took a sip thankfully before her family and then she was thankfully the only person who lost their life because of this, you know, poison that they made. It's tragic, but it could have been much, much worse. Everyone dying because of a rat poison plague? That's pretty horrible. But it happened again in 1599 when Margaret Moreland thought she was giving her husband ale. Really, it was arsenic trioxide and water, aka not ale. God, that would really suck. What a horrible mishap. Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously, lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people of course starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now, the lack of food, of course, led to disease. Now, if they didn't starve to death, illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The Great Famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day, it was horrible. Number eight. Weather Witch. Aside from that little ice age I just referenced, what was the weather like for most of these medieval travelers? Five seasons of Game of Thrones. They talked about winter coming, but what were those winters really like? People in the 1400s believed that bad weather could be caused by the behavior of wicked people, like killers, those who sin, incest, that was a pretty bad one. Game of Thrones would have been screwed off the hop. That would have been a lot of horrible weather. Even family arguments were to blame. You talk back to your mom, next thing you know, the crops are frozen. Nice, way to go, Eric. It's on you. Now this eventually linked back to blaming witches or sorcerers who some believe could control the crops and or weather. Yeah, sorcerers controlling your crops, imagine that. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in 1486, this book straight up references a witch that would fly in the air and create storms. Yeah, with effects that took lives of animals and farmers. No thanks, I'm glad we don't have any of those floating about. We just have drones now, which are just as annoying. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to 
to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had saint surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elijah or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, violence. Imagine going outside in medieval times. Is it dangerous? Is it lonely? Is it full of criminals? What's it like? What were those odds like just to get home? Street violence and brawls and taverns were as common as they are today. And like we saw a few times in Game of Thrones, peasants got a bit fed up from time to time. Yeah, I can't imagine why, huh? Vassals would revolt against their lords. This happened historically a few times. The rebellion of peasants in Flanders, this went down in 1323, and then 60 years later, England saw the peasants revolt in 1381. A lot of peasants getting fed up. Yeah, I, I would assume. I'm surprised it took that long, really. At number five, gong farmer. Now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now, as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the Middle Ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the Middle Ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently, people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. 
Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally at number 1, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the middle ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. At number 10, shaming parades. If you've watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked while someone behind her is ringing a bell chanting shame. Ding ding ding. Shame. It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's kind of human nature at this point, and obviously back then, they didn't have social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary, but the one thing that stayed consistent was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the streets and forced to drink the beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded and it was quite the spectacle. Now would you rather experience this or being cancelled on social media? At number 9, Cemetery Fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place where everyone goes for fun. The cemetery. Yeah, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husbands. Although corpse, if you're watching, hit me up. I love you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery and it was almost like the equivalent to going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. Before we carry on talking about the weirdest parts of life from the middle ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number 8, Judging Tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with the idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and the frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been different kinds of tears which they called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering and that they were so overwhelmed with emotion that they would be moved to tears and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it wasn't disturbing anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And number 7, Soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around for a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the dark ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't really have a name and there were no rules either. The only thing people followed when playing this game was the objective of winning. 
Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary besides deliberately offing people, of course. Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free-for-all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game, decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the city in future. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would really be intense if it hadn't. And number six, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is they were a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the Holy Lands while their tum-tums were throwing up gang signs and getting mad rumbly on the battlefield. It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water, and because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade where Louis IX had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. It all sounds like such a terrible way to go and a serious downside of being a knight. For number five, we're getting a little spicy with risque's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era? It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did come cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduced their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that 
can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is Trials of the Dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Famorpheus, the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to usurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Famorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to Medieval Madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the Medieval Madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems, as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would, of course, migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene, or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691, a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spine needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different. It's what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy, I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? 
I love Les Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, beavers. It's my national animal and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states who for sure eat this but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough. It's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kinda how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like it's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know. It's weird. Number six, sheep's business. When you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal, there's only one thing left to do. Wash it, clean it, stuff it with 10 eggs, milk, fat, and roast it with ginger and cinnamon. Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls, and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's is, is gabagool, you know, is, uh, is Wiener von Schnitzel minor. At number five, Bear Leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. Sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. And number four, the piss profit. As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. At number three, Muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there's another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food, and entrails had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. 
muckrakers can make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in six months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? And number two, arming squires. I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. And finally, at number one, peer finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for bookbinding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote-unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, toothworms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. 
According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. Number five, pole vaulting. The day pole vaulting was born was December 25th, 1521. It was a Christmas miracle, some would say. A laborer named Robert Baker he was heading home from the church after a Christmas gathering. Severe floods interrupted his normal commute home, classic medieval flash floods. So Robert Baker, the quick thinker that he is, he grabbed a tall pole and he just, he just vaulted his way over this new stream that had appeared. And then he then continued home. He just carried the stick home and he was like, what have I done? What have I invented? Now at Bumblebee, we don't recommend this as a commute. Don't pole vault over things in general, unless you're a professional, don't do that. Because later on, when attempting that same stunt, Baker's pole snapped mid-leap and he ended up drowning. Yeah, the poor guy bridged the terabithia himself. You don't want anything to happen like that. That's, that's really bad. Again, in 1540, a similar case. Somebody tried to leap over a pond, but the pole wasn't strong enough and it broke and they drowned. Do you pole vault? If so, comment down below how scary it is to learn because I'm interested. I don't know. Number four, falling bacon. If they ever made a Final Destination movie that takes place in medieval times, that'd be an odd pitch. This would be the opening scene for sure. This is crazy. Not sure how true this is, but if so, Oh boy, my palms are sweating. It was February 12, 1543, and Elizabeth Brown was working as a servant in the household of a man named Hugh Talmash. Now, this was over in Huntingdon. Things were going swimmingly, I guess, until a tragic accident occurred. Elizabeth was the victim of a freak accident while sitting by the kitchen fire. A massive, unsliced chunk of bacon was suspended in the chimney above her to smoke over time. And that day, the rope decided to just go, and then said bacon ended up crushing her. Now, if you're smoking meats, don't put Put it above or near you. That's a, that's a bizarre way to smoke meat. And also, if you're smoking meat, must be nice. That's a crazy charcuterie board. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally, here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he was was a little intoxicated, and Duncan, while doing his business, fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now, it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness in feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very horrible. That's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go, I think. That's the worst. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of clock making, and early on, these things, they were units. They were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett, it hit him right in the forehead and the next day, Brett died of his injuries. Guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. And finally, number one, horse racing. I think it's general knowledge at this point, but standing near a racehorse equals not a good idea. 
right? You heard it here first on Bumblebee. January 16th, 1540, two riders named Henry Headlam and Brian Newton, they were racing back and forth along a wall in a garden right outside of London. Casual medieval time stuff, just racing horses. Now, Newton's horse was going quite fast and Newton didn't realize that he was approaching an elm tree. Now, his head hit a branch from the tree and he broke his neck and died the next day. Now, right after this first tragic death, racing was seen as a danger to spectators and riders. More than fair. Riding a live animal at top speed. Yeah, that's obviously a little bit dangerous, I would assume. But then in 1534, Jane Jones was just watching, not even riding, she was watching horse racing, and then out of nowhere, a horse trampled her. Yeah, four days later, her injuries got the best of her. So if you're watching any live horse racing this afternoon, I don't know, have some distance maybe. Move up a couple of seats in the stands. Horse racing is big in uh, Ontario for some reason. I don't know. We have like one big one, constantly busy. Number 10 is sumptuary laws, which are the most common kind of medieval law. Defined as laws made for the purpose of restraining luxury or extravagance, particularly against inordinate expenditures for apparel, food, furniture, and etc. Sumptuary laws were enacted for the the purpose of regulating trade, but also regulate and reinforce social hierarchies by restricting foods, clothing, and luxury items. They did this so it was easy to identify someone's social rank and privilege in the name of good old fashioned social discrimination and class division. Bourgeoisie subjects appearing to be as wealthy or as wealthier than ruling nobility could undermine the royals' presentations as the most powerful in the land. Why, that could cause traitors and thieves and revolts. In late medieval cities, some Sumptuary laws were instituted as a way for nobility to limit the conspicuous consumption of everyone, most specifically the prosperous bourgeoisie, while still making it about poor commoners enough for it to slip past them while they were busy poking fun at those below them, they missed out what the royals sneakily did above them. Cowardice tax law is number 9. Medieval knights weren't always volunteers. In fact, a grand majority of many kingdoms functioned off of what was essentially a drafting of their men into the service, so it makes sense that not Everyone was as passionate about the idea of sieges or holy crusades or anything that could really get them wiped out in the name of a cause that just wasn't for them. So while it could be considered a great honor to be called to battle and you wanted to shirk your duty of obligation, you technically were able to pay a scourge, aka the cowardice tax, which originated in 1100. Essentially a get out of jail free card that you paid for with your own wage, royalty started to lean into this new tax source and by the 13th century it had evolved into a generalized tax on the knight's land. When the scourge tax reached 300%, the result of one king's want to force those to serve him all in a total Icarus flies too close to the sun fashion, it led to the implementation of the Magna Carta, which was forced onto royalty in the times to stunt their seemingly endless control and dictatorship. Sports banning is number 8. You've heard it in some of our other medieval videos, but we'll dive more into it now. Soccer and tennis were two banned sports of the medieval era. Handball, club ball, which is essentially baseball. Hand fighting, which we could call boxing I guess. This law, which was made in 1485, was due to the belief that British men were losing their legendary archery skills and also that these sports led to the sin of gambling. Obviously the rules didn't apply to royalty really, so tennis actually became an exclusively upper class sport for its etiquette, complex rules, and equipment requirements. Meanwhile football, as you may already know, was absolutely brutal. There was violence leading up to deaths and serious injuries and it was often played drunk and reckless. In 1388, a national statute demanded that servants and laborers throughout the country stop playing football and other sports and practice archery instead, the latter being necessary for the defense of the realm. They reopened the law in 1410 to add the punishment of six days imprisonment for violating this rule. Even then, it was only enforced sporadically as royals were still depicted playing this game during the time of its illegality. Unlike others, this law obviously is not still in place today. This older legislation concerning unlawful Awful games was repealed in 1845. Number seven says you're not for the streets if you do these things in them. There were a few smaller rules written in correlation with street behavior in medieval times. While it was okay to toss your feces just about anywhere, in 1839 a law imposed it be illegal to beat or shake any carpet or rug in the street. You can shake your doormat, however, but only before 8 a.m. in the morning. No carolers allowed then. It was illegal to sing songs and ballads in the street, especially if it was profane. And 
And if you were to disturb the people by ringing doorbells or knocking on doors unexpectedly and unwantedly, you could be fined. Try enforcing that on Halloween. Meanwhile, in Scotland, it is still illegal to date to turn someone away if they knock at your door and ask to use your bathroom, no matter the time, place, age, or person. Spotted in a crowd is unfortunately number six. Why unfortunately? Well, another fun, sumptuary law, and one of the earliest ever made in Europe governed the appearance of minorities and social groups. Enacting laws stating specific dress codes for religions such as Jews or Muslims so that they were easily to be identified from other people. In English colonies, Muslims were told to wear a crescent shaped brooch or badge while Jews had to wear a similar badge as well as a ring and a yellow cone shaped hat. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty noticeable in a crowd. Alongside people who were Muslim or Jewish, the royals regulated laws of fashion towards people with certain diseases, those not following Christianity as a religion, orphans, and women of the night. Essentially, as you can tell, these were the unwanted peoples in the kingdom. So unfortunately, as mentioned, the point of these garbs was to make these people noticeable. And number five, unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in the religious text, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used unicorns to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, as during the Middle Ages, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorns corn horns. And number four, divorce by combat. Back in the dark ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring and settle their disputes and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than having just an all out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands tied behind his back, while the wife ran around in circles with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? At number three, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found some bizarre ways of trying to see if someone was accused of witchcraft, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals from livestock to pets and even insects were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial the most for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of an unnatural crime of laying an egg. And even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be a quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had just way too much time on their hands. And number two, yummy people. As you could probably imagine for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else they were going through. This proved to be quite a huge problem during the Crusades because after supplies and food started running out, people got desperate and started seeing each other as snacks, if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through the journey to take back the Holy Lands, and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people lying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then, and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. And finally, at number one, watching consummation. 
back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage. But later on in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. They would do the good old brown chicken brown cow, boom boom pow, OMG wow, which would have been a positive or a negative experience depending on the circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching a live show on a Fifty Shades of Grey, and Joe would be like, you'll bet. Yes, that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that their marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything actually happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Yeah.